as a storytelling device, you can use an animal to help enhance that story and tell things about the character that you don't have to necessarily spell out. Simple symbolism like, you know, the tortoise is slow, the rabbit is quick, the fox is cunning. That kind of basic symbolism in the animal kingdom that, like I said, goes all the way back to fables and predates children's books probably is why I draw so many animals. I don't like to draw something really cute without there being something gently edgy or oppressive kind of battling against it. And there is that nice push and pull in my stuff where it can be a technological object with a piece of nature or something good and something bad and something evil and something positive. And I kind of like those things that bounce off each other and pull back and forth. And so the bunny and the skull are the simplest of good and evil in my world. You know, good being my circle of friends that I grew up with and where I'm from and evil being all things that oppose that good. This particular bunny is like naive and sweet and soft and you know what I mean? Like the cutest of the good. So that the evil part is the evilest of the evil and the, the bunny is definitely as cute as it gets. And it's, yeah, it's probably cunning, but has a lot of inner evil. Just down the hill from where we're sitting now was a giant old abandoned section of what at one time was the city's first orphanage. As of a couple of years ago, it was slated to be knocked down and they asked a bunch of artists to come in and do murals all over it. I really wanted to use the corner because it had a shelf built in it. And a friend of mine helped me make a really inexpensive fiberglass bunny, which we stuck without really asking on that little platform on the corner. What was only supposed to be a couple of years wound up being a lot longer than they expected and the people in the neighborhood around it really began to like it. When it came time to demolish it, everybody's really sad that it was gonna go away and the Hate Street Art Center, which is behind us, did a Kickstarter and raised over $70,000 to make what would be the, the largest crowdfunded public bronze statue in the state of California. I think a lot of public art is generally something that a small handful of people decided would be good for everyone else. I'm proud of this because 350 people decided <clears throat> that this was an important piece of public art and you can't really get that kind of pat on the back from a lot of things, so. They gave me a 75 year land grant. So like I own the slab of whatever that it's on for 75 years. And after that I'll be long gone and in my will it'll get donated to Golden Gate Park if it ever has to move, so. A couple of years ago, City Hall was having its 100th birthday and the Arts Commission was trying to design a unique project to celebrate City Hall's birthday. They reached out to me and they said, look, we loved your sketches, we loved your idea of making it a, a broader conversation with the, the greater population. <clears throat> Would you consider doing 100 drawings to celebrate the building's 100 years? And basically, we struck a deal where I said, I'll do the 100 drawings in 100 days, but you need to get me an office and a publishing deal. Because like, to make 100 drawings in North Beach about a building that's halfway across town is pretty fraudulent. City Hall was really, really generous and super warm and gave me a really funny place to work. And yeah, I sat there for 100 days. Uh, I did 100 drawings. And the book just came out this spring. It's called Oh Glorious City, and it's available pretty much anywhere books are sold from Chronicle Books. And it just documents the project. And it was wonderful. And man, it made a lot of people happy that live here. It turned a lot of people on that just moved here to things about San Francisco they didn't otherwise know about. Thrasher Magazine had always painted this amazing portrait to me 3,000 miles away that this was like the hilliest skateboard paradise in the world, and it is. <clears throat> and at 19, I really wanted to be a professional skateboarder. I just wasn't good enough. And so I wanted to come here and skateboard while I was still young enough to enjoy it and get a lot out of it and also go to art school. So I borrowed $100,000 in student loans and moved 3,000 miles from Albany, New York, where I was born. A lot of the rationalization of the loans and the moving and all that stuff was partially that I just wanted to live here. There's a debt of gratitude to that recipe because, you know, I moved here to go to college. I graduated from college, I got a really great job. I was just raised to be grateful and like, not for nothing, none of that happened accidentally. Like, this city kind of magically handed me this funny little career and at least for now I still feel this kind of, like I owe this place something for all that it gave me. And so fast forward, Throughout those 20 years, I've worked with all kinds of people in the marijuana industry. I've worked with growers who collected my artwork. I've worked with farmers who I drew art for their brands. I worked with 
the preeminent dispensary in California, quite possibly the preeminent dispensary in the world. My friend Martin Olive and the other member, early members of the Vape Room Cooperative, they were not only the first sort of high-end dispensary in the United States, but they were the first truly compassionate dispensary offering tea and fruit and free yoga classes and all kinds of assistance to the elderly. Another notch in not only California's belt, but America's belt in like the legalization battle of marijuana in this country. This company has been really special to me, not only because this is a wonderful collaboration and a project I'm deeply proud to put my name on, but like on some personal medical shit, uh, I had to go through a major transformation. I was diagnosed with a brain aneurysm and it was like the second question the doctors asked was, do you smoke? And uh, I had to quit cold turkey that day. And so at that time I was introduced to the people at Absolute Extracts through a friend. I was familiar with the fact that they were kind of the largest, most established brand at the time in the state. Uh, this company was very generous to me in helping me not only get through my own personal health problems, but like transition into consuming marijuana in a more responsible way that I'm grateful to Absolute Extracts for being there when I needed them, you know. It was a time in my life where I needed another option and I was grateful to them that they were there. I'm proud to work with this brand because they supported me and they supported my own health issues. I'm proud to work with this brand mainly because if you're gonna call something premium and put it on a shelf and say this is premium and it's endorsed by this artist, I never would have even considered it if it wasn't above and beyond potent, which I can absolutely promise any consumer who's skeptical about buying this collaboration, yeah, it's got my artwork on it. I decorated it, it looks lovely. It is without question the strongest cartridge on the market in California today. And like I said, I'm a heavy consumer. I've looked around. I haven't been able to find a cartridge that I felt was like anything even approaching this. No, we adjusted the amount of uh, actual tangerine terpenes that went back into it. I mean, I chose tangy as a strain because it's something that I have friends that have grown it for years. So I know kind of the history of the strain. Uh, when I was a smoker, I really enjoyed the kind of effervescent citrusy effects that Tangy's known for. And so the cartridge is not only testing at 90%, not only test tastes like Tangy, it has that same sort of citrusy effervescence that smoking Tangy gives you. I mean, experience it for yourself. From my perspective, this product is everything we say it is, and then some, which is the only reason I'm proud to put my name on it. To the city that changed my life, I'm proud of it for having this progressive economy and for being this place that changed the world. I mean, it didn't necessarily affect me or make me rich, but I'm not necessarily gonna turn my back and abandon a place just because it had a massive evolution at the same time that I did. I feel like me and San Francisco were both kind of running uphill at the same time. When my time is up and you know I have to move away, I'll go with a smile on my face and know that this city changed my life and I did everything I could to pay it back. And I don't know that the debt is ever gonna be fully paid, but I do know that I've made enough of an effort to do enough civic projects that the city knows I appreciate it by now and I'm not willing to leave without at least letting the place know that I like really gave a shit. And even though I can't afford to own a piece of it, I'm just trying to own a, a slice of life that you can't afford to buy, you know? like. Uh, the office at City Hall and the office at Coit Tower and the arrangements with my fellow San Franciscans and restaurants and businesses that support me locally. Like, this is a relationship you can't buy with a city. The city gave me a whole life I never would have imagined at 19. And in exchange, I'm just trying to give back with as much enthusiasm to let it know that I cared. I was taught to be grateful for things and people and folks who change your life and San Francisco and Absolute Extracts. I mean. They both changed my life significantly, so it's the least I could do to attempt to give back to them both.